So far, we've already covered what happens in a competitive market with what we might call an absence of government intervention or a free market outcome. And now we're going to go ahead and look at what happens under various types of government interventions. And I've put the subtitle here as Swimming Against the Tide. And the idea here is that essentially we're trying to go upstream in a way and redirect market forces into an alternative outcome. Everything we're going to say here is going to be about what happens in a competitive market. If we were to intervene in a less than competitive market, say a market with a monopoly, our results might be quite different. And in particular, the amount of economic efficiency that we get is actually going to be higher potentially with a price limit in monopolies than it is um, with an unregulated monopoly. So let's go ahead and start this in. Our first thing we're going to look at is price ceilings. And of course, why do governments typically bring about price ceilings? And essentially, it's because although the market equilibrium may be efficient, they have other objectives beyond or in addition to efficiency. And in particular, of course, people often think that high prices are unfair or bad or just unpleasant and they want prices to be lower because they are going to go ahead and see that as being more fair. So we're going to go ahead and look then at price ceilings and just to make it explicit, a price ceiling is a legal maximum that you can sell something for. Thou shalt not charge more than blah blah blah. It could also be you can't pay more than blah, but typically it's actually levied on the seller. Not every price ceiling is what we call binding. The idea of a binding constraint is one that actually limits someone's behavior. And in particular, say for instance we're looking at the market for gasoline, we would see that if the normal equilibrium price of gasoline is $4 a gallon and we bring in a law that says you're not allowed to charge more than $5 a gallon, well, that law doesn't actually limit anyone's behavior because no one was actually trying to sell gasoline for $5 a gallon. So for the price ceiling to actually have any effect, it must be below the equilibrium price. So that it actually causes people to do something that they otherwise would not have been doing. And in particular, of course, what happens is that prices are lower and then we are going to change the amount that people are willing and able to buy and sell. Unsurprisingly, as we lower the price, we're going to go ahead and make the good more affordable to more people. So we are going to have quantity demanded grow from the 100 it was in the market equilibrium to 125 as we make the good affordable to these people on this region of the demand curve. Quantity supplied is going to shrink because remember that the height of the supply curve at each point is the seller cost for that particular unit of quantity. So the 80th unit of quantity, say for instance, might have a seller cost of say $3.20. So when the price is forced down to $3, the person who would have sold that 80th unit no longer is willing and able to sell and so they drop out of the market. So quantity supplied shrinks, and in particular it might shrink from 100 down to 75. Notice that when we get this shortage, it actually comes about from, from both sides. It comes about because the price ceiling causes more people to want to buy the product and more pe fewer people to want to sell the product. And I think that's not something that people typically think of. If people think of price ceilings ca causing shortages, they think of it as mainly sellers taking their ball and going home. But it's actually also bringing people into the market as well that causes the shortage. Now, of course, all else equal, buyers like low prices. So consumer surplus is higher when prices are lower. Sellers, on the other hand, of course, don't like low prices. Producer surplus, producer economic welfare is driven down by the price ceiling. So 
one way of looking at price ceilings is that they're a form of redistribution and we're going to transfer resources from producers to consumers. There are some complications though. Obviously, we have this change in the amount that people want to buy and sell. And because of that, some transactions are not going to occur because of the price ceiling. And in particular, as I said here, some sellers that could have profitably supplied at the equilibrium price won't or can't at that lower price. So, while in the old equilibrium, consumer surplus was everything above the equilibrium price and below the demand curve, now the amount of transactions that actually occur is here at Q sub S, because although consumers want to buy this amount, sellers are only willing to sell this amount, and the number of transactions is always the lesser of the amount that people want to buy and the, the amount that people want to sell. So, these transactions here, between the equilibrium quantity and Q sub S, no longer happen. And nobody gets any consumer surplus from a transaction that doesn't happen. So, this area C that used to be part of consumer surplus no longer is. Before the price ceiling, producer surplus was everything below the equilibrium price and above the supply curve, so D plus E plus F. And now it's everything below the price ceiling and above the supply curve, so it's just F. So producers have lost E because those are transactions that no longer happen. They've also lost D because they now get a lower price for these transactions up to QS. So consumers get A plus B plus D, and producers get F. Notice that in this diagram, D is larger than C. But you can imagine if the price ceiling was really aggressive, then although we would be making D taller as we brought in a more aggressive price ceiling, we would also be making it skinnier. And so, at some point, a more aggressive price ceiling actually makes this region D here smaller. On the other hand, a more aggressive price ceiling always makes C bigger. And so, eventually, a more aggressive price ceiling that pushes prices down lower and lower here is actually going to make C larger than D. So, a really aggressive price ceiling will actually hurt the consumers. It's always bad for the producers. The price ceiling is always bad for the producers. The next slide is going to run through all of this. The last thing to add here is this region C and E is what we call the dead weight loss. D is a loss. Producers don't get D anymore, but it's transferred to consumers. So it's not a pointless loss because on net, it's not a loss. It's a transfer. C, on the other hand, and E are lost, and nobody gets them. So they're dead weight, they're useless. And that's where we get the phrase dead weight loss from. Again, this slide just lays out everything that I verbally said on the last slide. So you can go ahead and have it all written down in one place. Another thing to keep in mind is that the steepness of the supply and demand curves can vary. And in particular, one thing to keep in mind is that supply and demand are flatter in the long run. Because in the short run, something like the supply of apartments is pretty insensitive to the amount of rent that landlords can get. The, the apartments are pretty much built. They can't build any more in the extreme short run. And essentially, if the landlord lets the apartment go vacant, that money is lost. So they really want to fill the apartment at almost any price, really. So both the supply and demand curves are going to be really steep in the short run, what we call inelastic. That's going to mean that the shortage is going to be relatively small. In the longer run, though, people can go ahead and build more apartments 
or they can take apartments and convert them into condominiums or commercial space or something like that. So in the long run, the quantity of apartments supplied is much more responsive to price than it is in the short run. So the supply curve is flatter. At the same time, people's desire to live in this city is going to be much more sensitive in the long run than it was in the short run because people might say well you know I otherwise would have moved to a different place but I have such great rent here that I almost can't afford to lose it or other people might be actually attracted to live in the city by its controlled rents so we're typically typically going to see the shortage becomes larger in the long run than it would have in the short run last thing to talk about in this video segment are various costs that aren't seen in the graph. When we have a price ceiling, we are blocking some mutually beneficial transactions from occurring. And when we do that, we're essentially going to go ahead and create a situation where there's an incentive for corruption, where people are going to do deals under the table or in evasive ways. So we may get corruption, we may get black markets. Another alternative is that if landlords already have more customers or sellers have more customers that they can, than they can handle and they're not allowed to raise their prices, they're going to use some other way to decide which customers to sell or rent to. And so it might become more a matter of who you know rather than how much you can pay. So favoritism and social connections and political influence are going to influence the allocation of the goods. And so instead of people working to make more money so they can afford to get the goods, they're going to work to build political connections so that they can get access to the artificially cheap goods. So that's going to divert people from making more pie into um, trying to basically get a slice of the artificially cheap pie just by knowing the right people. A related issue out there is inefficiently low quality. If producers can't choose the price quality combination that they think consumers will like the most and they're forced to charge a lower price, then they're going to let quality slide because there's no point investing in quality that you can't charge for. Or put differently, what we observe out there is that if we have rent controls and if apartments normally would go for $1,000 a month, sort of medium nice apartments go for $1,000 a month, and then rent control forces landlords to cut prices down to $700 a month, then they're not going to invest in keeping the apartment up. Because again, remember, they already have more potential tenants than they have apartments because of the shortage. So they're going to let things deteriorate and slide downhill till the apartment really is only worth $700 a month. Last, we're going to go ahead and see in a later video lecture the idea that when we have a price control, the goods are not rationed to the highest value usage. And that's actually going to be in the best in the case that our price control is actually successful in bringing in buyers who could not otherwise afford the goods.